Hi, I'm Dr. Tim Kaczynski, and today we are going to demonstrate the protocol for placing a Han dental implant in the edentulous maxillary right second bicuspid area. So what I want to do is go through the entire process that I go through to make you more efficient and proficient in your implant placement. The first thing we did is we took a digital radiograph, a DEXIS radiograph, and we have a ball bearing uh, that is of known diameter. It's a five millimeter ball bearing that we purchased from Salvin Dental. It's important that we use a very precise surgical ball bearing of known diameter. And with our DEXIS uh, system, as with most digital systems, we can actually do some measurements. So let's just go through the process if I can. So with the DEXIS system, I'm going to go to the to the measure and here it says measurement canal calibration quick single multiple calibration ball calibration ball finder so I'm going to go to ball calibration manual and I'm going to the ball bearing now we know in the mouth this is a five millimeter ball bearing and I'm left clicking the little X on the top part of the ball bearing and I'm simply you can see how it turns green and I'm measuring that um, ball bearing. And here you can see it says enter the diameter of the ball. It says 5.19. We're going to change it to 5.0. So now we know we have a complete calibration. I'm then going to go to multiple calibration lines. And again, this is where we want to place the implant. So if I kind of go from the crest of the bone, left click, and hold it, and I'm going all the way to the top here. We didn't get quite high enough on that radiograph, just to give me an idea. And you can see it says 14.36 millimeters. That means with the Han system, we could put an 8, uh, a 10, 11 and a half, even a 13 millimeter implant. Probably would not put a um, 16 millimeter implant. It's very safe, very effective, very efficient. So this allows me to to demonstrate the amount of vertical uh, hard tissue that we have prior to any surgical intervention. Of course, this does not tell me the amount of vertical or horizontal width that we have. So we'll say OK. Even though we're trying to demonstrate how to uh, surgically place a dental implant uh, predictably two-dimensionally, our CBCT analysis is a real helpful tool for those situations that you're just not sure um, of the amount of available hard tissue that you have. So our CBCT allows us to see things in three dimensions. It can even allow us to virtually place the implant or even um, a virtually design the final prosthesis. But oftentimes in my diagnosis, I will take a C CBCT and the view on the upper left side of the screen is the sagittal view. It's a cross-sectional view. And if you look at the panoramic view, you see this orange line, and that's basically the area where I'd like to place an implant. And it'll give me a cross-section. And when I look at this cross-section, I can measure from crest to where I think the floor of the sinus is. And you can see it says 15.2 millimeters. With our two-dimensional, we said 14.6 uh, or 7. And then I'm looking at the available width, and it says 7.7 .7 millimeters of diameter. Now, in our lectures, we teach that we'd like to have at least a millimeter. I'd like to have two millimeters uh, buccal or facial and palatal in these situations where possible. That allows me for good emergence profile and a very strong implant. In the past, we used to say longest, fattest implant in a certain situation. But with our modern technology, we want less titanium, more hard tissue. So if we have 7.7 .7 millimeters of available horizontal bone width, that allows me to very predictably place a 3.5 diameter Han implant in that position. 3.5, 4.5, 5.5, 6.5, 7.5. 5. So that will essentially give me 2 millimeters of facial available bone heart tissue and 2 millimeters of palatal. If we wanted to put a wider implant, we possibly could, a 4.3, 5.3, 6.3, 7.3. That would allow about a millimeter and a half facial and a millimeter and a half palatal. In a bicuspid situation, the go-to implant is oftentimes the 3.5 diameter. 
So here, I kind of have an idea of what size implant I'd like to have. I could have a 3.5 or a 4.3, and I could have an 8, 10, um, 11 and a half or 13 millimeter. In my thought process, I'm looking at possibly 3.5 by 13 millimeter implant, a very long, strong dental implant to effectively support uh, a, a second bicuspid in the, in the maxilla. So, but for, as I said in my lectures many times, for every implant you think you're going to use, you need one longer, one shorter, one wider, one narrower uh, to make sure that you have uh, an ideal situation and get the ideal surgical result. And we're going to demonstrate how we do the rest of this procedure two-dimensionally. As we can see the edentulous space in this area, open big uh -huh. okay. you can see that it appears we have a good vertical width of bone. We see that that tooth is a little bit mesial verted, which means the root is a little bit distally verted. But pretty much it appears to be an ideal situation for a dental implant, even if we didn't have our CBCT analysis. So what I like to do is I like to draw. And so I'm taking a Sharpie, disposable Sharpie, and I'm just drawing a line. And that's going to kind of help me visualize the angulation of the implant uh, as I surgically place it. it. will also help me with the emergence profile. The next step is we're going to go ahead and anesthetize the patient. And this is important because we must have attached gingiva on the facial aspect of our implants. If we don't have it, we have to create it. But the best way to determine if there is indeed attached gingiva is when we infiltrate. Remember, we're not blocking anything. We're just infiltrating the soft tissue. Bone itself is not innervated, has no pain receptors in it. So we just need to numb the, the soft tissue. So what I'm doing is you can see there's a little frenum right there. And I'm going to go ahead in my area, and I'm just very carefully, very infiltrating, and I'm watching the tissue bubble up. And, be, and draw the mucogingival line. Now, if we look at the mucogingival line and we look where we want to place our implant, we see that we have a good maybe five millimeters of attached gingiva. So this may be a punch case or what we call a flapless procedure where we don't need to make an incision to reflect the tissue. So let's make it simple, and obviously we'd probably want to place the implant about in this position. Remember our rules, we must be at least two millimeters from the uh, PDL of the adjacent tooth, and, and adjacent implants need to be at least three millimeters apart, but we're only putting one implant in today. So before we begin, what we want to do is make our initial penetration into the hard tissue, and to do that we're going to use a 2.4 diameter pilot burr. It's a very small burr, a very sharp burr, that will allow me to perforate the cortical bone that is available. I'm not going to depth. I'm going to use this burr to help me uh, angle the implant mesial distally and help me to visualize the final implant position facial palatally. Um, I put an extender on our um, burr here. It's just a latch extension, just so that I have a little more access to show and then the latch will simply fit into that. Here it snap in. Now we're going to go about 800 um, RPMs at about 20-25 Newton centimeters of torque. Um, it's, it's slow but it's going to be very efficient. The Han burrs are very very sharp, very efficient burrs. He demonstrated the use of an extension but because his mouth is relatively small I'm going to just go ahead and put my pilot burr directly into the latch of the handpiece. And I'm trying to visualize tooth up. I'm thinking of the tooth first rather than just placing the implant. And I'm using the line as kind of my guide. Um, this tooth is going to be about an 8 millimeter wide tooth, mesial distally, a male um, bicuspid tooth. And I'm also using his, um, his um, teeth in his mouth now to measure to give me an idea. And what I'm going to do is I'm simply going to run the handpiece 
And I'd like you to use two hands if possible. And I'm simply going to pump up and down. And I'm really just going a little bit into hard tissue. And then taking my pilot burr and placing it back into my osteotomy. So I position the implant, mesial distal buccal lingually, and now I'm going to take a radiograph to make sure that I'm in the position that I want. This is not my final depth, it's just deep enough into the hard tissue to stabilize this initial uh, pilot burr. So let's go ahead and take a radiograph. So looking at this radiograph, I know we can cut it a little bit, but I wanted to show we have, it looks like we're pretty parallel to the um, natural tooth. So we have our angulation where we want, and now we'll go to use what we call a tissue punch. And again, you can purchase these in different diameters. I'm going to remove uh, very cleanly the soft tissue above our osteotomy site. This will prevent uh, us putting epithelium into the osteotomy site um, and also will prevent tearing with our uh, subsequent osteotomy burrs. So I'm just going to the site and I'm going to push and I'm kind of rotating. I want this incision to be nice and clean. So use a little bit of force here. The next burr that I like to use is the 3.0 diameter burr, and this is going to determine my final depth. The subsequent osteotomy burrs are only going to widen. And you can see, I decided to place a 13 millimeter long implant there, and you can see the line on there is pretty delineated. But we have to measure the soft tissue, area probe. And, and you know, maybe two and a half three millimeters, probably two and a half. But we're going to use our digital radiography to determine the final depth. We know our angulation is correct. So I'm going back into my pilot hole area. Again, using two hands. And I'm going to go to depth. And I've included the two millimeters of soft tissue there. So here you can see I ended my 13 millimeter burr at the level of the soft tissue. So let's make some measurements here. We'll go back to our measure device. We'll go to multiple calibration lines. And here's our, we know from, from this point here to here is 13 millimeters. So it says 13.84, and I'm just going to make it 13. We know that's precise, so we don't have to worry about elongation. Then we can measure from our contact point to the center of our burr. And we're hoping that that's going to be around 3.5 or 4 millimeters. So 4.79, 4.5 approximately, which will allow us to have a nice, wide, uh, final restoration in that spot. So what I did now is, I know I wanted to go about 2 millimeters deeper, so I took my burr and I went 2 millimeters deeper. We can control our hands, as long as we're using both hands when we're doing our osteotomies, a quarter millimeter, a half a millimeter. So I kind of pushed up and down a little bit, let the burr do all the work, another two millimeters. So we'll take another radiograph and let's see if we're at the position we want. And again, at the 3.0 diameter burr, and we know that the area right here is 13 millimeters, that little indentation, and we see that we're exactly on the floor. Now I want you to remember that these burrs are about a millimeter, almost a millimeter longer than the final implant itself. So I'm in great position here. I feel very comfortable. We're putting a very strong, long implant in an ideal position. And you too can control this by using two hands. 
We also want to determine the, um, the uh, quality of the hard tissue. Is it soft, medium, or hard? Here I'm going to call it medium. So I am going to go ahead to use my 3.5 diameter tapered osteotomy burr to position. And here to help me, I went ahead and put my extender back on and I have my 3.5 diameter tapered Han osteotomy burr. This will be the final burr we're going to use. What we did. And again, using two hands, I'm going up and down. Now the magenta line there is about two millimeters. It looks like I'm in great position. So let's look at our final osteotomy burr. Now it looks like I went a little bit deeper there, but not really because oftentimes it's a, a reflection of the angle of the radiograph that we took. And remember our palatal heart tissue may be a little bit um, taller than our facial tissue. This is a flapless procedure so that we can't see it completely. But I'm pretty happy with the position uh, of, the, um, of the implant and the um, final prosthetic results. And again, if we go back and we measure, multiple calibration lines. We know from here to here it's a 13 millimeter. There's some elongation there. So let's call it a 13. And again I'm thinking tooth from here to the center is 3.25, so if we double that, we're talking about a six and a half, seven and a half, um, seven millimeter, eight millimeter uh, tooth in position. Again, the radiograph is a little bit uh, deceiving there. So as we discussed, we chose a 3.5 by 13 millimeter Han implant, and this is a pretty ingenious packaging. It's like a clothespin. We'll take our insertion tool that has a little washer in it and what I'm going to do is I'm going to squeeze the part where the implant is and I'm going to take my insertion tool and it'll actually snap into position. I'm going to then open the clothespin and you can see how it, it comes out. And I'm going to go ahead and, and run this. We run it at 25 RPMs. Here we set it at 30 Newton centimeters, 25 Newton centimeters with no water and you can see how slow that's going to turn. Yeah, and I think it's imperative that when you're slowing the speed, always test yourself. And you can see it's rotating very, very slowly. The surgical site has very, very little bleeding. We have complete control. So even our patients on, on moderate uh, blood thinners, it's not a real big issue for me. So we're going to go to the site. And I'm simply going to run the handpiece. Now I'm not going to put this implant all the way in. I'm going to stop at soft tissue. Now remember we said we said the soft tissue was about two millimeters. So let's take a radiograph and then we can control it the final position with our torque wrench. I don't care so much about torque, I care about position right at the crest. So let's go ahead and torque the implant to its final position. And what I'm going to do is put my insertion tool and I have my torque wrench. It's a nice torque wrench and it's, uh, you can change the uh, Newton centimeters. You can see here we have 15 and by simply turning the uh, little light blue knob 20, 25, 30. Again, I don't care so much about torque, I care about position. So let's go ahead and I'm going to put my insertion tool back in the implant so that it locks in and I have it set at 15 and it clicked and 20 and it clicked 25 
equated 25, so I'm somewhere between 20 and 25 newton centimeters of torque. So let's take another radiograph. Again, I care most about position rather than um, torque. So let's look at our final radiograph. Again, we tried to parallel the adjacent tooth. I think we did fine there. We look two-dimensionally like this is the floor of our sinus. Okay, we're, we're away from that. Remember that our surgical burrs are nearly a millimeter longer than our final implant, so we're very, very safe in this area. But let's, let's measure our tooth position. Okay, so again, we'll go to our measure, multiple calibrations, and we know that this is a 13 millimeter. And then we look from the contact point to about the center of where our crown will be. And remember, ideally, we wanted it to be about four, right? All right there. 4.61. We'd make another measurement. I'm just kind of guesstimating here. You know, about four millimeters. That's what we said. We wanted about an eight, nine millimeter by cuspid tooth in, in that range um, to, to give him aesthetics. We're away from the natural tooth root. If you remember we said we wanted to be at least two millimeters from the adjacent PDL. Here it says 2.24 and if we measure from the tip to where we think the floor of the sinus is about 1.4. Remember I said the, the, um, the, bur the surgical burrs are about almost a millimeter longer. So we have ideal position and it's all about control. Now, I'm going to go ahead and put a, a cover screw on here rather than a healing abutment. When we're able to achieve a certain amount of torque, the literature will say 25 newton centimeters, we can put what we call a healing abutment, which is simply a taller screw that will penetrate through the soft tissue. A cover screw will be buried underneath the gum, and the gum will grow over the top of it. Epithelium grows about a half a millimeter, up to a millimeter a day, so we have a maybe a four millimeter wide space so within a week that's going to close over completely. Um, I like to put uh, cover screws if the patient's wearing a removable appliance they don't have to deal with adjusting that appliance especially if it's been comfortable for a long time um, or if the um, we don't get 25 newton centimeters of torque and if you remember I did get 20 newton centimeters but I did not achieve 25 so what is the final torque? Well, it could be 21, 22, 23, or 24. So I'm going to go ahead and put a, a closure cap or cover screw into that implant. And here we have our star tool, and this is our, our uh, cover screw. They're all color coded with the Han system. Open big for me. I'm going to sight. And I'm simply going to find the implant and thread that cover screw into position and I'm just hand tightening it. Do not torque these into position. So you can see the surgical procedure uh, is relatively non-invasive. There's really no bleeding. Um, we are looking at, close for me please sir, we're looking at the interocclusal space here and we have plenty of, of room there for an abutment and an implant retained crown or a screw retained crown uh, in this situation. Remember, uh, if we have five millimeters or less of interocclusal space, I will do a screw retained uh, implant crown, uh, Bruxer, Glidewell Bruxer crown. Uh, if I have greater than that, then a custom healing, ab a custom abutment, custom prepared abutment, and a final cement on crown is appropriate. Now I have, um, for my entire years of practice, I will inject any surgical site with dexamethasone phosphate and it's just four milligrams per cc, so one cc to the site. It's a steroid, will minimize swelling. So the surgical procedure went, went very nicely today. It allowed me to have complete control two-dimensionally and it certainly is within the realm of all of you here today. But it's imperative that you understand the rules that we have to follow. You want to make sure that you have control and these procedures become rather routine after you accomplish a certain number. Now as far as post-operative um, instructions, what I will tell my patients is I still provide the patients a low dose of antibiotic, amoxicillin 500 milligrams three times a day for three days. If I'm able to start the patient the day before, I prefer that. 
The American Academy of Implant Dentistry clearly states, though, if there's no sign of infection, an antibiotic really isn't necessary um, in, in those situations. It is rare that I would give a narcotic in this, this certain situation. Remember again, bone is not innervated. This is not like an extraction where we're ripping the nerve and hurting the patient. The only thing the patient could feel is the small penetration through the soft tissue. So I will give 600 milligrams of ibuprofen uh, three, three times a day uh, as needed. Many patients do very, very well with that. Um, 800 milligrams is no more efficacious than 600 milligrams, so there's no reason to give any more than 600 milligrams for pain relief. The most important thing for our patient is ice to the outside of the face. So I'll tell the patient, we give them a little ice bag to use on the outside of the face. And what I say is keep it on as long as you can, take it off, let it warm up, put it back on, uh, and use it religiously throughout the day. Uh, if you do that, we'll minimize swelling. If we don't have swelling, we don't have pain. If we don't have pain, it makes us look very, very smart. I like to see my surgical patients uh, in a week just to make sure that they're doing well. And I always call my surgical patients the evening uh, of surgery just to make sure that they're, they're comfortable and then we follow up the following day. So um, if, if our patient wouldn't mind, I'm going to take your glasses off. And if you wouldn't mind looking at the camera and, and Jessica there, and what was the experience like for you? Was it, was it bad? Was it worse than you thought or easier than you thought? Easier than I thought. Yeah. Did you have any discomfort whatsoever? A little pressure, maybe? No. Okay, fantastic. So, you know what an implant's like now. Now you can tell your friends, and, and we can move forward from there. Thank you for your, your time today. I appreciate it. All right, thank you.